Happy December 4th. Are we ready to have some fun today? You know the best things in life are free. And for my friend Lars, there's a chord changes. Yeah. We'll get back to that in a minute. But in a minute, let me say hello. And remember, the best things in life are free. need yourself. Just stay in that turn around roundabout. Oh yeah, I love this. Cause you can breathe a little bit. How you guys doing today? Let me refresh my uh, Facebook page. Today I'm broadcasting on my friends and students page. So that we could all hang out together in one nice place. So I'm doing what's called a tag in that tag at the end of the song or it could actually be in anywhere in the song 
And that's when you kind of just go around and around. I'm going to look for my broadcast now. There it is. So I can see who's there too. Oh yeah. I see who's there now. Three, six, five, three. Hey, Richard! Hey, Mom and Dad! I love Richard, he's a great student. You made a smart kid. Make a big ending. <laughs> there you go. Modern technology. It's great. How you all doing today? Oh, that's great. Well, I love to uh, play music, as you can tell. And it's fun. For me, it's been my whole life. And uh, music is just a great thing to do. So if you're looking for something extra to learn, rather than maybe a new game or application, maybe something like this would be interesting because uh, you can continue to grow in your skill of playing music, which is actually quite simple, actually. And music began with the most simplest of intention because music was already there, see? I believe that. Like a language, music just needed to be discovered. And once it was discovered with the first rhythmic phrase, and I like to say it that way, because everybody thinks about music as notes, you know? But without rhythm, those notes have no place to go. So the first instances of music were probably more in the rhythmic fashion than they were harmonic because they didn't have portable keyboards available. Maybe some stones and sticks and some hollow logs or something that changed the tone and by hitting like this and hitting like that, two tones were created. And that's the moment whenever that was, that real music was created because music takes a flow, we'll call it rhythm, right? And it needs harmony. That's the notes that make the chords and the chords that make the notes and all of that great stuff. It's really quite simple. And if you've been following along uh, the show, you've noticed that I'm starting to get you to groove a little bit on some blues. You didn't know it, but you are. So today we're going to continue on the journey of playing some blues. And you'll remember just briefly recapping. And by the way, I'm creating the show as we go. So suggestions are always welcome first. Secondly, I do want to do more playing because that's fun. <laughs> but I love to teach too. And so here you go, right? So if you want to be kind of part of my family and friends, they are my family. All of our friends are family, right? Uh, you can join my Facebook group. Uh, it's called facebook.com, and you go to the group section, Tony's Hang. Come on in. We have some of the greatest organ players hanging out, sharing information, because I love to share information. And together we all grow and have a great time. Last week, Lars says, hey, do you have some sheet music? And I thought that was a great idea. If you noticed now for three weeks in a row, I open with this song called The Best Things in Life Are Free. So if you go to my website, uh, and I'll give you the link in the show here. I can do that. Look at this. This is great. I really, let's see, how do I do this? First, I got to do that. Uh, you you can get to the music, okay? 
and here's the link. But I want you to go to this link because this is important for your continued education on this shop talk journey that we're taking, okay? So let me paste it here. As you notice, the pace of this show is not like an entertainment show. It's an education show. Because when you're learning, it takes a little bit of extra time, if you know. But if you go to my site, you'll notice that this shop talk page is dedicated to the show. And of course, I put the manuscript there for you so that you can take a look at it. And this week, I played it in the key that you see there, okay? And if you scroll up, you'll notice that I put a video every week. So this afternoon, I'll put a video up for today's lesson with some practice stuff and some hints for you. So please go to this page. It's very important. And today's lesson, we're going to continue. And the reason why I need you to go to the page is because we're going to look at this little thing on the left here called the circle of fourths. And we're also going to look at this little thing on the right here called the fingering for all 12 major scales. So visit b3monaco.com, okay? And when you go there, if you just go to that address, it's pretty simple. You can either follow the Shop Talk show logo or take a look at the top, okay? And while you're there, take a look at the videos that I have and something about my lessons. And also, I have some nice play-alongs. So enjoy the website. I got a lot of nice, cool things there, and I offer things to try to make education possible for you easier. That's important to me. So, okay, let's go all. All right. So we're going to start with the just a brief be recap of what we covered last week, and then we're going to continue real quickly to the next because now they're going to start building, so I won't have to do so much explaining. But remember, we started with the C on the left hand. Okay, and we put our pinky there so that we could use our index finger to play the G, right? Because we said that this G had a particular reason for itself, okay? It took us home. We call that the five, and we briefly spoke that you could find that easily by going up five notes of the major scale. And that's why at the website to the right, is the fingering for both right hand and left hand for two octaves. I believe if you're going to be a keyboard player, you should at least practice your scales in two octaves because you'll use them better. If you only know where to stop at one, you'll always hesitate. And when you're getting into high-powered music, you can't hesitate. You have to just go for it. And it's built in the muscle memory. It's built into your practice time and uh, try not to look at practice time as an as something you have to do look at it as a chance to get intimate with yourself and your fingers and get comfortable with the different key changes and not try to rush the process listen man the greatest musicians are still practicing why because we got to keep our fingers and our chops up you hear that all the time. Man, I've been off the road six months. Man, my chops are down. i got to get them up. Well, that's because just like exercising or any other thing that takes movement, you've got to kind of get it going again. You've got to get the blood flowing. You've got to get the stretching, the muscle strength, right? So take a look at practicing as a chance every day to just take your own time to maybe relax and learn it a little better this time. See, that's the way to do it. Just learn it a little better the next time. Don't try to get there. There's no getting there. There's no tomorrow. So what is always going to be today. So <laughs> Wait, it's now or never. Oh, well, you know, music is uh, about melodies, isn't it? Okay, so last week we said that we could go one and five and one and five and one and we repeat each one too because we got four beats, right? So music is mathematical in many ways. When we look at the circle, you'll see that it's got its own little mysterious beauty in the way it moves around. And you're already started to learn. You just didn't know it. 
because I like to teach from the feeling first. Remember that on the right hand, we were playing an E and a B flat, and I said, you could play it like this now. Remember, I'm gonna show you something called inversions, or you could put the E down here, right? So you put the E down here and the B flat here, or move this E up here. That's called first inversion. Now this chord only has a first inversion, because it only has two notes, so it's either got this or this. And whether you go down and up and up and down from there or here or it's the same. Just imagine just flipping it upside down, right? And this is what's really cool that what I'm going to start to begin to show you uh, is I have been showing you a special kind of chord called a dominant seven chord. And I have resources available uh, to help you see because visualizing these things uh, is going to help. There are different kinds of chords as you well know. There's a million kinds of combinations, right? Where does it begin? Where does it end? I guess is the best way to start okay but chords have a couple of things in common and one is we've been talking about these threes and sevens right so three what do you think three might say it's the third note of the scale so if I was to make a C major chord I'm putting the letters, the notes D and, excuse me, F here because these are the continued notes of the diatonic scale. If you look at your paper for the fingering for the C major scale, you'll see it contains all of these notes that are not flats or sharps. They call this the diatonic scale. So looking at C major, we're going to look at all of these white notes in between C and C, all right? Hope I'm not putting you to sleep. Here we go. C, E, G. Why is the three important? Because when you move it, it comes minor, major, minor. So they, they call this thing the chord qualifier. Okay, just remember that it qualifies the chord as being major or minor. We all kind of know that already, right? So I don't have to say more about it. But if you put it in your hand, in your right hand, that's what that note says. We're major, we're minor. And it's necessary, especially when there's a movement that's gonna go from major to minor, right? That note is the one that tells us that something has happened. The other note that's kind of important, or really important, is the seventh note. And I like to explain it as the, the way out and it's got a name, actually, and it's because of that. It's called the leading tone. So we said this one was a chord qualifier, major, minor. This was a leading tone. It decides whether we're kind of resolved or we're going to move, okay? And depending on what kind of chords you have, these chords act differently, okay? So the dominant seven chord... I want to help you get things clear right away. And this one is important. You see them on paper written like this. That's it. Okay? Now, sometimes they got funny numbers. And if you see those, that's even more, be more better. That's even better. Because then that will guarantee you that that's the dominant seven. We're not going to go there in lessons we do. But let's just say for now, whenever you see C7 on the paper, okay, that is a dominant seven, okay? When you see C 
M-A-J-7. Notice? It's got some explanations. Well, why? Because this chord is different than this chord. Okay, let's just stay just right there. I just want to show you different chord types and what this leading tone does. Now, let's look at another chord. Just, just to spice it up for a minute, let's just say C M7. Ah, okay. You see, the every one of these chords, what makes them different is, guess what? The 3 and the 7. The 3, now we're starting to see, makes these minor chords. C minor 7. Oh, okay. What's going on with this 7? Same like this. Okay, it's kind of like a dominant 7. And it works the same in the leading tone, and we'll explain that in a minute. How about what other chord could could you possibly need right now? There's a billion of them, you know. Let's just stop right there because I want to explain how this leading tone works now because I think you already get this, okay? So this is just a short little jog because we're going to be looking at the circle of fourths right now as I'm going to show you what you were doing and what we're going to do next to build our blues. Sound cool? All right, so we see that if it says C7, it's a dominant 7, and I'm going to show you what that looks like and what this leading tone does. They say when it's a major 7. Sometimes you'll see it notated with a little triangle than the 7. Notice there's nothing funny in front of the C7 because that's a serious chord. <laughs> the funny stuff comes after because it's a serious chord. No, they're all serious. I'm just kind of like, this one's important, all right? It's like the mother load, all right? Uh, this one, they say that when it's a major 7, it's resolved. Listen. It feels like it's done. Oh, and I watched last week's lesson when I played these high notes. They hurt your ear, so I'm going to stay down a little lower. That's uh, my learning experience from watching myself and trying to better myself to deliver a better message for you. So C major 7, that's this one, okay? Sometimes we see a little diamond 7. It's kind of done. It's the one we talk about, about when I've been talking about that little turnaround or roundabout. It's how we get out. It's how we're done. We're done. You hear it? But watch what happens. Oh, wait, before we go there. Wait, yeah, no, no, let me stay here. I care about how I deliver this message because I don't want you to get confused. A lot of teachers confuse you. And then you learn things that maybe you shouldn't be trying, or, or you learn things incorrectly. So I want to try not to confuse you. So listen. We know this is major. We can feel that. This says, ah, oh, we're done. Just, just hang with this chord for a minute. I love major chords because they, you, you can play around with inversions. See, this is C, E, G, B natural. It's all in the key of C major. So most of the time when you see these major sevens, they're the key you're in. Not always, but most of the time. So major sevens are pretty. Remember we talked about inversions. We can move the C here. Sit around and play with the different sounds of... Oh, that's a cool sound for C major. How about... See, they all have a unique rhythm in themselves in the way the waves generate. So some of them will stir up different feelings. Sit around and play with the chord for a while. Listen to it. Hold some of the notes as you move and release them, feel them. Just, it's really interesting. Now watch what's going to happen now. You've been relaxed on your seat saying, oh, that's beautiful, oh, that's beautiful. All of a sudden I say, oh, what just happened? Oh, the leading tone, the seven, 
They say when it is a dominant seven, it's got to move and it can't move back up. It's coming from there. See? You see the rhythm of this? Let's just put this back on C so you can kind of hear this flowing rhythm. Major seven. I know you already heard the bass, because the bass wants to say. And this finger and this finger move down. See? So the leading tone moves down. It leads you out, because the moment you touch that note, you have changed keys. So you cannot go up, because up is not a note of the scale of the new key that you've just gone into, okay? So you can see now why I said that dominant sevens are the mother load, because they make the decision of where you are. They tell you where you are. They're like the flagpole. And when we see them, we know instantly what diatonic key we're in, all right? So I'm gonna show you something and we're going to go on now with our lesson from last week to show you where I'm going to go now. Okay. Take a look at the circle of force real quick. Let me go there myself. Okay, scroll down. That's the for, uh, shop talk page at b3monaco.com. See this thing? This thing is like magic. It's like, man, it's the key to the musical universe. And if you look to the right, there's the scales that belong to them. And they all belong to these different things called key centers, keys, right? What key are you in? I'm in C. What key are you in? I'm in F. What key are you in? I'm in G. If you look at the keyboard and you go the five notes of the C major scale, you'll notice that's the chord, or that's the key to the right of C major. Hmm. If you go up four, ooh, there's the F. I know you can't see my fingers, but just use your ears. That, that note needs contact clean. Here's how you do it. You just repetitively hit it. There it is. Oh, it's going to be a little stubborn for a few days. Okay. So go one, two, three, four. That's F. That's to the left. One, two, three, four, five. That's the five to the right. And remember, we said the five makes you feel like you want to go home. So you go to the left. If you want to make C feel like you want to go home, it goes to F. If you want F to go home. So if you notice, since it's the circle of fifths, remember I told you last week to start paying attention. What is the fifth note of C? Well, just look on your circle to the right. It's G. What's G the five of? Well, C. So if I'm playing a bass line in C, I want to use the note to the right as my turnaround. Okay. Five, one. Does that make any sense? You can hear it, can't you? This doesn't quite make it. No. But, yeah. Right. Okay, so we go to the left. We're going to the four chord. We go to the right. We go to the five chord. This is the key to music. This is it. So study this thing. I want to show you a couple interesting things before we get off. Look at C at the very top. Look right below it. It's got a lowercase a, and it says minor. In the music world, those are called the relative minors. So if you've ever heard that term, the relative minor. Sounds important, isn't it? Well, yeah. It's because it's the relative of C major, all right? It operates under the same diatonic scale. They're attached. 
one just is the minor reflection starting on a different note of the same scale. And that's important to know that because in the future when we start looking at some small modal things, we'll notice that we can play a major scale and start it on different places. And it sounds really cool. Okay, so enough of the circle for now. Let's go back to the lesson. I'm trying to get this timing because it's hard to teach this stuff so that you can absorb it. So bear with me. I can't entertain so much, but this is important to me to leave this for you guys, okay? So tell your friends if you want to start learning a little bit about how music operates. This is free on the website on the YouTube and all of these videos that the extra videos are at the website and I'll be giving you examples and wonderful things to continue your journey okay when we looked at this chord that we played we say that this one's a dominant seven remember we just looked at the major seven being resolved and when it's a dominant seven it's going to lead you out and where does it go it goes down See how these sevens and threes are kind of like intertwined? They move together when it's a seven as it goes down to the res resolution, becomes a three. That's so cool, okay? So they're just kind of like, don't, don't fret about it. Just go with the flow. If it's a dominant seven, most of the time, even if it's a C minor, C, C minor, now we put that chord quality. So we covered this subject. <laughs> this leading tone will still move down, see? Because it can't go up. Well, if you want to play some interesting colors, it can, but in the harmony world, it goes down. Okay, so now, what we're going to try to do is take a look at this, and I've tried to show you that that circle of force, okay? When you went to the left, you went to the F. Well, something really interesting about the, these kind of dominant seven chords, and I don't want to get into why for now and how all that works, but it just does. I want to show you something, and if you pick this up, man, this is really, like I told you, this is where it's all at, this moving a half step down and moving a half step up, okay? So if I take these two notes, and I move them up, remember? Uh, uh, up, down, uh, uh, G, uh. Right? Well, guess what? When you hit this five on the bass, and you went up here, if you're playing G7, wow, is that amazing? Because look, here's the three. See, G, one, two, three. And there's that seven. It's not saying, Ah, oh, let's stay. No, it's saying, let's move. It's going to move again. Okay. Where's it going to go? Oh, boy, it's going to go down, right? It has to go down, has to go down, has to go down. Okay. So, when we are at G, wait a minute. What if I just stay here for a minute, right? What if I said... Oh my gosh. Well, at G, I could go down up and come back up to G. Can I go up and down? Of course I can. So this week I'm introducing the G7 chord. Okay, last week we were playing around the last few weeks with C7. Now we're going up. Down, up, follow me, okay? How about up, down? Both fingers, half step each, okay? Sometimes you have to stop to figure this out. Down, up, right? Down, up. E and B flat. B and F, right? Let's look at it the other way. C and F sharp. B and F. Just a half step. They call that a semitone. I wonder what a tone would be. Uh, 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 uh. 
So now you're in G. You're not in the key of G, you're playing G7. These things are mother load chords, right? I told you because they, they take you home. They take you to wherever the one is of that. Okay, that's how they work. That's why last week I started making you to get adjusted. Doesn't matter. If you got something that can go to a one, it's a five. It's always going to be usually a five. Okay. So this week, what I want you to do is when you go from G, leave your index finger on G. And you can take either your pinky, however you feel best. For me, it's hard to stretch my fingers right here. So it's easier just to put my pinky on its five. But let's look at it first. One, two, three, four, five. So the note's D. Now whether I play it up here or an octave below, it's still the fifth note of this G scale. So I'm going to say one, one, five, five down there. And I'm going to say uh, uh, down, up, okay? Uh, uh. How about up, down, up, down? Hey, how are you? Up, down, down, up. So what we're going to do, this is going to be great, okay? We're going to start playing a song today, and it's really simple. You already have the key. We're going to play an eight-bar blues in the key of what they would call G blues, all right? And if we look at our fancy circle, C, right, it's 5 is G, right? So when I went down to the left, I went from G to C. If I went up from G, guess where I'd be going next? D. So when you go up now, you're saying G, D, G, C, G, C. F, C, G, C. So the G's the same, right? And the C's the same. They function differently. When you're in G, you always got to land on the B and the F. When you're in C, you always land on the E and the B flat. We've covered that quite clearly. So keep that in mind on all of these drills until I someday change that. And as... Uh, Okay, here it is, my magic marker. The magic talk show board. <laughs> so we're inventing it as we go. All right, God help me, because I don't remember what I was going to say. I do. Okay, so now we just learned this G7. So we're going to make two lines. I'm going to show you how to read music chord charts. That's what we do. We read chord charts, and then we fill in the notes. That's how I'm teaching you, okay? I'm going to do something funny at the end of this. I'm going to put two lines, maybe make this a little thicker, okay? Put a couple dots in there. Do the same thing here. I'm going to put another line and put a couple dots in there. Those are called repeats. It means when you get here, go back. Simple. Now, if there's nothing left, just keep going back. It's a big tag, right? <laughs> okay, so s let's just put that first, that new chord up here, G7. Remember, that's the one that has F on the and B. You could put them in, in any place, right? Inversions, F and B. So the notes are F and B. But our bass notes are going to go down. They're going to be G. And what did we say the fifth note was? One, two, three, four, five. D. Okay. So we're going to go down in this case to, G, to D. B. 
because you, we know why now. I'll show you. Let's play this four times. One, two, three, four, two, two, three, four. This is how you count. And four, two, three, four. Let's stick a couple of measures of C7 in here. Remember, C7 is what in the circle to the left. To the left. And when we're there, this is our center, right, with C. And it can go down and up and down, do whatever you want, as long as you end up there. Then we're going to say G7 again for two measures. And then we're going to go back to the top. And that's an eight bar blues. So we call blues by the number of measures. There are eight bar blueses, and this is ours. This is called the Talk Show Blues. And you are all going to be the ones that invent this blues with me. So this is going to be so cool. Okay? So take a note. You can watch. See, I, I, I put a light there to uh, allow you to see the keyboard better, and it's annoying, isn't it? There, we, we bypassed it. Four measures of G7. That's 16 beats, right? Two measures C7. That's eight beats and two measures G7. Eight beats. All right. So when we're playing the G, we said we were going to go down. Two. Three. Four. Now we got to go to C. It's right there. And look, it's still there. So when we play our C, all we have to do is move our strike note beginning. This has to always start with G because that's G7, right? That says G. When we get to C, we got to play C first. C, D, 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 Okay? So this is all this hand has to do. Now you know why I rest it. When you don't have to work it, relax it. Just keep your hands nice and relaxed, never tense. So remember while we were on the G, let's just, let's just keep this real simple the first time around. We're just going to play quarter notes on the root, and we're not going to do any fancy going up or down. Let's just stick to the form, okay? And I'm going to put the form where you could kind of see it if it doesn't slide down. We're going to have to invent something for this. I've had this problem before. But let's try. Maybe no vibration. So we're going to say one, two, one, two, three, four, G, two, three, four, second measure, two, three, third measure. to say C and go down a half. Remember the circle. Now we go back up to the five, to G. And we start again, so you can't get confused because this is a new beginning. It's a new G7, too. Right? You gotta kind of look at it that way, like it's a new beginning. So you can't get lost. You have to pay attention. We're going to go down to the four. Down, two, three, four. Now we're going to come back up. And what happens now? We act like nothing happened. We start again. Two, three, four. Uh -oh. So I just want you to keep. And when you have the play along to play along, I'll have several courses. So you can uh, uh, get it, all right? So happy blues playing. Here we go. See? Got to play a little bit of blues. It makes you happy, actually. I don't know why. Maybe because you can express your feelings. I don't know. It's kind of cool, right? All right. So just you already have many of the notes uh, that I gave you last week uh, that you can start playing with this. So let me kind of introduce you to just something that's once again, let me put down the sound. Dangerous. It's dangerous. But it's so fun, 
Okay? So here's what it is. You already know the notes, okay? Here's my magic pen. So last week and the week before, we kind of started looking at like C, E, F, G, right? U and D, right? Because we said you could play all of them <laughs> and B flat, right? And sometimes even E flat, right? Remember? Wow. And I even said sometimes even G flat. Notice that all of these notes right here are on this line. And these two notes are not. Guess why? Because these two don't belong to this scale. They're the word they're they're they are where the fun is, mama. Alright? They're color tones, they're called altered tones. But you gotta play these first, right? So we kind of looked at grouping it as a major five pentatonic C D E G A. We said try to use these notes and sentences and making words first and then add these other colors. I kind of made B flat sound like it was something special, but it actually belongs in the same key. Uh, now you're starting to see that this C7 is a five chord. They say five. Roman capital five seven. The magical chord. So C, this one that we started with the last few weeks, is the dominant seven. So, what do you suppose that would be the five of? The F. So, if you look at the fingering and the key of F, it has one flat, B flat. There it is. So, that's really not an aug augmentation or alteration or anything. These are. So, we learned that this pentatonic kind of works really cool, right? All right. So, since we're playing with five chords and I said... That's why when you see the C7, that's the mother load. It, it, those dominant sevens are the reasons why all these wonderful little beautiful things can happen. And we just saw some magic just by lo moving our hand to the left. We went to the four chord. Why, not, why didn't we go to the half step below? Because these two things, remember I told you they become sevens, then threes, it's magic. Just, it's magic. All right. So uh, let's, let's finish. I don't want to lose my train of thought because I'm going to give you some new notes that's going to make the G sound good. I'm just going to give you one pentatonic scale. A lot of times when people play blues, they assume it as a minor, even though it's a dominant seven usually, unless it's minor blues. So they imply that minor third. Remember the chord qualifier that we talked about? So let's just kind of do that with G and make a pentatonic out of it. Let's say G, B flat. Remember, let's keep this in common, right? Because this is in common with C7. So let's keep it in this equation. How about C and D then? And F. Wow. Okay. That's different. Doesn't really have like any common sense order to me, but let me just tell you that this is called the G minor pentatonic. Okay. And I don't want to talk about what that is, except it has the same formula. It's just one minor three, four, five, six, oh, oh, three, five, six, one two well it's one minor three four five it's a crazy thing seven okay so it's the same thing you can kind of see it as one two three four five but you can see these minor pentatonics have to take on a little bit of a different shape to get that chord qualifier in and i don't want to tell you about the key changes and all that right now it's just 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 no that these notes that we're working on, G, B flat, C, D, F, 
are of this G minor pentatonic that we're superimposing on top of this G7 chord. And that's what the blues scale does. So where all the fun was at, Mama, where was that demonstration? Oh, did I erase it already? Okay, those extra colors, uh, those colors are coming in. Like we're doing one right there, see? We've added something. We've changed the diatonic note to some color, and it sounds cool. So you don't have to worry about why and the theory behind it right now, but just listen to it. So if you can start it on G, and remember that sliding stuff. And remember when you got to C, now you can just right here, you can begin those other notes that I gave you. When you get back to G, watch this. Ooh, now you're back here. So the bridge for C7 is here. The bridge for G7 is here. That's how we get in and out of one key to another. You see what we're doing? We find the bridge. We cross the bridge. We go to the next key. We hang out there for a while. We cross the bridge. And the music, we play four bars of G7 while we say one. Maybe you can play the chords like uh, uh. Now we gotta go down, remember? Start again, remember, a new day. Mm -hmm. There's my bridge, see I'm in G now. Let's go back beginning here we go well I have this B natural can I play that B natural of course I can if it's in the chord you can add it and I just kind of played those scale notes that belonged to F major for my C7. Now we start again. Check this lick out. Take D and G. Just kind of mess around or kind of slide this one. Whoa, isn't that cool? How about D and B flat? How about D and B? Altered that. Can you hear, hear that? See? So that major and minor functions in making things like kind of like lifting or kind of like dark because it's what? Minor, down, major, up. And so uh, those intervals are kind of moving in and out of all these shapes. And piano players learn them as upper structure. As organ players, we learn voicings to accommodate those key changes. So happy practicing. Don't forget to go to the site and, you know, refresh yourself on the circle. You can print them out. And we keep them, make some notes, keep in touch with me. Let's see, do we have any questions? We still have seven minutes. So that F in the bass pedal is purely percussive. Okay, all right. You want to talk a little bit about bass pedals. That's great. And many of you may have clones, okay? And this is kind of important. All right. The, the Hammond itself, the real, like, vintage Hammonds that had the multi-contact keyboards, 
they had that technology, right? That was the technology that they used to make the instrument work with all its polyphony, okay, and all that goodness. It's just accessing 91 spinning wheels. And someone asked me, so that F in the bass pedal is purely percussive. And that is correct. Uh, I have a theory I tell my students about the organ. I say that this is the organ, this is bells and whistles, and the pedals down there, they're chaos. Because if you don't know what to do with them, they can create some serious problems, okay? And they're playing all them big low tones. <laughs> so they're, da they're dangerous. So <laughs> I entertain myself. You can, I can leave the, I could take a trip and never leave the farm. So uh, I love to teach. It's fun. Music is great. And teaching helps affirm uh, the wonderful things that were given and passed to me. So that's why. So when you push the pedal all the way down, it plays the whole note, okay? And the way I sit on the bench is, let me see if I could take this camera. Whoops, not that one. Let me take this camera. See how I'm kind of seated at the bench? It's not the best, best view. But my backside is at the back of the bench, and my foot is actually just kind of hanging, hovering. And you can kind of see where I've worn it out, because I've had these pedals since 1976, right? So they say that Jimmy tapped on B. I tap usually on A, sometimes G. Has nothing to do with the note. Because when you tap it the way we tap it, it's not about the note. But it's about where you sit on your bench. Now, I like to sit with my nose about at middle C. That's why the first chord of the show the, or, or something, the melody, I missed. I was, I was over here adjusting, and I sat too far to the left. And so my hands have that muscle memory. It goes where it goes. It was a step off because I was a step off in my rear end. So I line my nose up normally when I'm going to play. I get in just a little closer because I like to be able to have my foot about right there. You can see where it hangs. All right, so it's just hanging. So when I sit with my nose at middle C, it's hanging at A. Now watch this. This is the cool thing about the Hammond. Even the bass pedals, as you push them down lightly, start to play. Like when you have the 16-foot drawbar pulled out, you're not playing just one tone. You're, they have this little thing in the back. I don't know what it is, but it, it makes a combination of drawbar settings and assigns it to that. And the only difference between these and that is this includes the 16-foot low notes that come. And this is the second octave, the beginning of the second octave. It's 31.7 hertz. Why do I know that? Because I'm trying to allow that in my mix without getting distortion. It's, it's very low, okay? It's very low. And they've got pipe organs that'll go an octave lower. You can't hear it. It just rattles everything. It's an unbelievable sensation. Your cage rattles, okay? The bass is very powerful. So as I push this note down, Hear it? Hear the different tones? Let me go back here. Oh, maybe up here. Let me take another one. Here. That's a first tone. There's the next one. There's some other ones. So when you're tapping, you want to find the sweet spot where you're just tapping the top piece. So I'm not really generating a sound of a note. I'm just generating a little click to add to the bass. Tap. If you don't have pedals, just tap like my three sons. Get used to 
light tapping, right? Beginning. One, two, three. Up, down. Watch this. can tap the pedals that you're playing to if you like. Doesn't matter. Watch this. When I tap C, I'll tap it just as lightly. You won't hear C. You'll just feel this little click. Up, down, down. See? I could tap any one of my one. It doesn't matter. Okay. All right, cool. All right, so I hope that helps you too. So if you don't have pedals, I do believe that if you can get your metronome going and start learning to tap your left foot with the metronome, you'll keep better time with your hands. There's something about getting your foot tapping with the groove that helps your whole body then start to... So play with the metronome, tap your feet, tap your left foot especially, because that's what I do. And it becomes very natural and you just kind of just like start doing it. And it adds to the organ bass. Why? Because, you know, when you play an electric bass, it's got a percussive attack. You hear it? There's your slap. It's, it really pops out. So you hear that click? Well, here's the organ bass. It's just kind of more like a ooh, ooh, pluck. So this is the pluck. So that's why you don't want to go all the way down. You just kind of... just by adding diatonic scales to whatever chord you're playing as long as it doesn't have funny numbers attached to it. There's one exception, two exceptions to the rule. Now we've learned that C7 is not a funny number. And there's another one, but we're not going to talk about that today. God bless you guys. I hope you have a good week. Keep in touch. I'll get this video up for you to practice along so we can start the uh, eight bar Tony Monaco, Shop Talk G Blues. And by the way, send me some examples. I'll play them on the show. All right, guys. We'll see you next week. God bless. Take care. Thank you.